Looking back, I recall helping out with a retreat entitled Strengthened by Faith During Difficult Times. I was asked to share my journey with grief using the Gospel reading from Mark chapter 4 verses 35 through 41 as a roadmap for my reflection and sharing. Who is this whom even the wind and sea obey? With the coming of evening that same day, he said to the disciples, Let us cross over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind them, they took Jesus, just as he was, in the boat, and there were other boats with him. Then it began to blow a very strong wind, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that it was almost swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, his head on the cushion, asleep. The disciples woke him and said to him, Master, do you not care? We are going down. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Quiet now, be calm. And the wind dropped and all was calm again. Then he said to the disciples, Why are you so frightened? How is it that you have no faith? They were filled with awe and said to one another, Who can this be? Even the wind and the sea obey him. I envisioned myself in the boat with the disciples, overcome with grief by the raging storms that took control of my life. My life was a series of storms, and with each one, I was slowly transformed through my relationship with God, others, and the power of love. Sister Bethany Fitzgerald, Sisters of St. Joseph, and director of the retreat, asked me to share my story with my fellow retreatants. The first storm I encountered came from early miscarriages that caused a great sense of sadness and disappointment in my struggle to become a mother and parent. The second storm I encountered came from the loss of my stillborn son in the summer of 1986. I can remember how difficult it was for my husband and me. Our little one's untimely death affected us deeply. It was quite an emotional struggle to go through. Our quest to become parents was stripped once again from us. It was a wound that festered in my heart. It led me into a dramatic form of grief that began to suck the joy out of me. I was overwhelmed with a deep, unimaginable pain I have ever felt. My world was shattered. A part of me died. I tried to be strong, but my grief got the best of me. It took a videotape to provide me with the looking glass into myself. I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like what I had become. I could see that my grief changed me. The lens of fear and anxiety gave me insight into the immense turmoil going on inside me. I could also see how it was affecting my relationship with my family and those closest to me. I wondered where God was in all of this. I felt loneliness. I felt isolated from God and those I loved. I felt alone. No one knew how I really felt. I had trouble dealing with the emotions and expressing what I was feeling in my heart. I reached a point where I was so engulfed with grief that I asked God to come into my heart and heal all that was broken. My brother-in-law gave me a book called The Living Word, a scripture study that helped me to grow in my understanding of God's love. I recall being at Mass. Father Brown, pastor of St. Lawrence Church in Louisville, New York, played a tape of a beautiful talk a lady by the name of Ellen gave on suffering. I felt inspired to go see Ellen. I am glad I did, because in those few moments, in, in those few months I spent with Ellen, I felt closer to God than I had ever had. I was moved with compassion while spending a very short time with Ellen as I watched her battle with terminal cancer. God brought Ellen and me together because he heard our cry for help. The minute I opened up my heart and spirit to God's love and mercy, I felt the zest for life I never felt before. I looked forward to spending time with Ellen, and as I did each day, the sorrow I harbored deep in my heart was being emptied out. Ellen's spirit was lifted up through the warmth of God's love. God placed Ellen in my life to help me experience the love he had for me. Ellen took me under her wing and helped me to grow through my grief. I wrote prayerful letters to God, asking for Ellen's healing. Those letters were placed in a binder and kept close by Ellen's bedside for her to read. Ellen told me that the letters in that binder gave her hope at a time in her life when things seemed hopeless. Ellen said, do you think you can write for others? When I looked into Ellen's eyes, I knew that it was God himself asking me, so I told Ellen I would if God wanted me to. I was at church one day, praying for Ellen. 
Father Brown walked up to me and said to Cindy, would you do something for me? I said, sure, Father. He said, would you pray for someone who will be going through a great struggle? Pray this person will persevere and I will pray too. I told Father Brown that I would pray. As Father Brown walked away, a strong feeling came over me. I realized I was the person he was referring to. After Ellen died in the fall of 1990, I again felt a void. I encountered storms one right after the other. I experienced the dramatic loss of a cousin in an automobile accident. I grieved the loss of people very close to me, especially grandparents. As time went on, I had another miscarriage. I remember finding out I was pregnant with child. I was in my early 40s struggling to accept the fact that I was pregnant. I was ready to go into my second phase of life, but with the help of God's grace, I was able to lay my fears and anxieties to rest and found peace with the pregnancy, trusting Father God that all things work together for the good of those he loves. After four months of carrying the baby in my womb, I found out that the baby's heartbeat stopped. It wasn't long after that I miscarried. I was heartbroken. I grew to accept the pregnancy only to find out that the little life I carried in my womb was given a brief time to live. But the strangest thing was that I felt peace, a peace that came from God alone. I remember a week or so after a miscarriage, I was sitting in the living room with my three children watching a movie. Suddenly, I felt myself gasping for air. I went outside on the porch to catch my breath. I remember praying, God, what is wrong with me? I couldn't breathe. I actually thought I was going to die. I told a friend about my experience. She listened to me and lovingly suggested that I seek the help of a psychiatrist who just moved to town. I told her that I didn't think I needed a psychiatrist. A few days later, I had another breathing attack. I didn't know what was happening to me. A great sense of fear came over me. So I called up my friend and told her that I had just had another attack that was much worse than the first one. My friend happened to look down and noticed on the page of a local newspaper the name of the psychiatrist she previously told me about. She gave me the doctor's phone number. It was on a Saturday, which means doctor's offices aren't usually open. I was so desperate that I called the number anyways. To my amazement, the receptionist just happened to be there. She said the phone lines were being set up in the office and she was there to oversee the work being done. The receptionist told me that she would put me down for Monday morning and that I would be the doctor's first appointment. After seeing the psychiatrist on Monday, I was diagnosed with anxiety disorder and depression. Here I am in the boat once again with the disciples, struggling, struggling with not only that festering wound from pain of loss and separation, but anxiety disorder and depression. Once again, a storm hit one after the other. I think of a picture of my dad and my nephew Aaron, who was just a little guy at the time. They were walking on a winding road. Aaron was walking uphill just ahead of my father. The picture of my nephew and my father speaks to me of God's plan. I know the plans I have in mind for you. It is Yahweh who speaks. Plans for peace, not disaster, reserving a future full of hope for you. From Jeremiah 29, verse 11. The picture also speaks to me of God's timing and the wound of the heart. At the age of 13, my nephew Aaron was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, a form of bone cancer. I had faith that gave me peace when I found out Aaron was sick, but as his sickness progressed, I got caught up in his struggle. I took my eyes off Jesus, who has power and control over anything difficult that comes into our lives. I looked at Aaron's scary situation and became overwhelmed with the fear of losing him. Each time Aaron's illness got increasingly worse, I wondered if God was really listening to my prayer. Aaron died in the spring of 2011 at the age of 16. Oh, how I prayed every day, hoping for a miracle. I felt so brokenhearted when Aaron passed away. I stood there in silent prayer asking God why. Where is the miracle, the cure, the answer to our prayer? I felt anger, disappointment, and the pain of losing someone all over again. A short time after Aaron passed away, my father would predominantly follow in Aaron's footsteps. Dad battled with prostate cancer. He died 19 months later. I felt like one of the disciples in the boat asking the Lord, do you not care about what is going on here? 
During that time, my mother was struggling with Alzheimer's, a brutal disease that destroys the memory. She was diagnosed with this illness during my father's battle with cancer. Here I am again in the boat with the disciples, struggling with not only the cross of pain from loss and separation, but the fear and the heart piercing sadness of losing my mother too. When would that pain and void in the depths of my soul subside? When would the hurt I was feeling be alleviated? I was so caught up in my grief that I got stuck in it. I lost sight of what joy really is. I became the spectator watching all that was happening to me and letting those tragic moments suck the life right out of me. I realized that I had to do something about it. I needed to take steps towards opening myself up to God's love. Praying and asking God for healing was a big step in the right direction. Seeking the help of a counselor to help me process my feelings was another step. Having a spiritual director to listen to me, guide me, pray for me, support me, encourage me, and walk with me in my journey to persevere was a tremendous step because I needed not only to think of my physical and emotional well-being, but my spiritual well-being as well. Listening to Christian songs and music with nature's sounds in it soothes my soul. Reading scripture and inspirational books gave me wisdom, understanding, and hope. Spending time in nature with unwritten scripture helped me to feel close to God. I always seem to feel his presence in such an awesome way through the things I mentioned. Rather than remaining a spectator, dwelling on the obstacle that kept me stuck in my grief, I became a participator and began to do the things I needed to do to open myself up to the power of God's love and presence in my life. I recall going on retreat at the Sisters of St. Joseph's Mother House just before Thanksgiving. While walking outside on the grounds of the Mother House, I came upon an injured buck adorned with a beautiful rack of antlers on its head and clothed in a thick fall coat. I noticed the buck had an injured foot that he was favoring. From the expression on his face, I could tell he was hurting. I felt empathy for him because he was not only dealing with an injury, his vulnerability to predators was imminent. On my walk, I stopped at the statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus to contemplate the image of the wounded deer. I listened to a song called Power of Your Love. As I prayerfully listened with my heart to the words of this song, I felt the warmth of our Lord's presence within me. I was enlightened. Just like the deer, I too am vulnerable when I am weak, wounded, or hurting. Matthew Ward expressed in the song what I was feeling in my heart. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I have found in you. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. As I continued on my walk, I stopped by the statue of Blessed Mother Mary to reflect on the sorrow that was not just in my heart, but the sorrow that pierced Mary's heart as well. I noticed Japanese lantern flowers growing in behind Mary's statue. That imagery of Japanese lanterns made me realize how blessed and grateful I am to have God's grace working in my life. Each person that came to me during the mountain peaks of my struggle to help me, guide me, encourage me, and pray for me were like Japanese lanterns lighting the way through the dark night of my soul. In his book, The Yellow Brick Road, William J. Bosk writes, The Christian community should talk just as loud and long about God's presence in the most hopeless situations as we do about the miraculous healings. I remember shortly after the baby's death, my mother-in-law received a message from God while praying for my husband and me. She was asked to convey this message to us. God said, tell them, I will bless them. God blessed my husband and me with three more children in the years that follow, a daughter and two sons. I know that sorrow and disappointment came knocking at the door of our hearts, but in time and with the help of God's grace, my hu husband and I found the courage to embrace our pain with love and gratitude for all that God blessed us with through our stillborn son and the miscarriages. We were and are very grateful for the gift of parenthood. There was also such an amazing outpouring of love and support coming from my parents, in-laws, my brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters-in-laws, relatives and friends who were there to pray and see me and my husband through my struggle to give birth to our stillborn son. 
I also remember how supportive the nurses and the doctor on call were in helping me and my husband through this traumatic experience. I think of the many people who reached out to us via cards to let us know <clears throat> they were praying for us. Father God sent us angels to look out and care for us. I am grateful that he put angels in our life to provide for our well-being and to help us get to where we are now. God was there for me when I struggled with a miscarriage. He was in my friend who made the suggestion to see someone and get help. He was there when my friend looked down and saw the psychiatrist's picture and her phone number there in the newspaper sitting on her table. He was there when the doctor's office just happened to be open on Saturday so I could talk to the receptionist who in turn set up an appointment for me two days later. He was there in the psychiatrist who talked me through what I was experiencing, helped me process what I was feeling, diagnosed me, and treated my symptoms. He was there through the many prayers being offered up for my husband and me. He was there through those who came to me and my husband who offered themselves as a crutch to lean on through their kind words, hugs, warmth, and love. After reading the book, Choosing Gratitude, your Journey to Joy by Nancy Lay DeMoss. I realized that the Lord has taken me on a journey to train my heart to respond to all of life with a spirit of gratitude and thankfulness, even in the seasons of trials, hardship, sorrow, suffering, and grief. In a reflection entitled Finding Gratitude in Times of Hardship, Marquita Harold writes, It's not what happens to you, it's what you do about it, and gratitude can open the door to finding your path out of the storm. Gratitude is an invitation to transformation. I was asked to make a lotus visual of the transformation that you can see before you. On the board, you can read about the lotus flower. The lotus flower begins its life cycle born in the bottom of a murky pond, surrounded by muck, insects, fish, and mud. The flower makes its way through all kinds of obstacles, rising from its rugged conditions, untouched, unharmed by its dirty surroundings. There is not one stain, drop of mud, or dirty water on the lotus as it slowly unfolds its petals to the light and warmth that flows from the sun. As nighttime rolls in, the lotus flower closes and sinks beneath the murky pond and rises again in the dawning of each new day, unharmed and untouched by its murky surroundings. Despite being born into dark, murky, rugged conditions where beauty and life for a flower seems hopeless, the lotus grows and rises through the darkness of adversity. Each day is a joyful celebration of a resurrected new life. You can also see a visual of what transformation looks like. <clears throat> Fear into faith, weakness into strength, despair into hope, suffering into peace, sorrow into joy, mourning into dancing. I also put up on the visual board couple of quotes that helped me. From the Emperor of China movie, Mulan, the flower that blooms in adversity is a rare and the most beautiful of all. Just like the lotus, we too have the ability to rise from the mud, bloom out of darkness, and radiate out into the world. Anonymous. In William J. Job Bach's book, A Yellow Brick Road, tells of an ancient Sufi story that tells how important transformation is. Once upon a time, a stream was working its way across the country, experiencing little difficulty. It ran around the rocks and through the mountains. Then it arrived at the desert. Just as it crossed every other barrier, the stream tried to cross this one but it found that as fast as it ran into the sand, its waters disappeared. After many attempts, it became very discouraged. It appeared that there was no way it could continue the journey. Then a voice came in the wind. If you stay the way you are, you cannot cross the sands. You cannot become more than a quagmire. To go further, you will have to lose yourself. But if I lose myself, the stream cried, I will never know what I'm supposed to be. Well, on the contrary, said the voice, if you lose yourself, you will become more than you ever dreamed you could be. So the stream surrendered to the sun, and the clouds into which it was transformed were carried by the raging wind for many miles. Once it crossed the desert, the stream poured down from the sky, fresh and clean, 
and full of the energy that comes from storms. Think of yourself like that stream. When you are ready, are you willing to be transformed? The Sufi tale reaffirmed for me that Father God can truly raise us up and give us new life. What about love? We are transformed by and through love. A really important way that love transforms is through the movie Shadowlands, a movie about a relationship between writer and university professor C.S. Lewis, Jack, and poet Joy Gressel, her death from cancer, and how this challenged Lewis's faith. After watching the movie, I can say that I am thankful I made the decision to love just as C.S. Lewis, Jack, did, even though the fear of losing someone we cared about weighed heavily on our hearts. I know I felt empathy for Ellen, just as Jack felt empathy for Joy. We both cared about the day-to-day -day struggle Ellen and Joy faced with her illness. During that time I spent with Ellen, I felt a godlike love stronger than the love that was in my own heart. I experienced a godlike love that brings warmth, healing, and peace to a broken spirit. Jack felt this, that same love. I remember talking to Sister Edwards, a wise friend, about the awesome experience I felt when I spent time with Ellen. But since Ellen died, all I could feel was a heart piercing sadness that left a great void in the depths of my soul. Speaking about the experience, Sister Edwards said, you may never feel that again, and reminded me of Jesus' words, do this in memory of me. Like Jack, I made the decision to love even though it would hurt all the more when Ellen died. The joy Jack and I were feeling became a part of our future pain. I can see myself walking closely with Jack in the movie Shadowlands. I felt his pain. I can understand what it feels like to push someone away because of fear, the fear of losing them. The loss of his mother was a traumatic experience for him. I can understand the emotional walls that Jack created and put up to protect himself from grief. I can also understand how these emotional walls kept him from having relationships, intimacy, joy, and hope. He was trying to live his life in a self-protected mode until joy came into his life and helped him through his grief. She helped him see with lens of faith the emotional walls he created to control his hurt. She helped him to see with lens of faith the emotional walls he put up in his relationship with others. Jack saw the lens of faith the grief that Joy's little son Douglas was experiencing after the deaths of his mother. Father God provided Jack with a looking glass into himself. With lens of faith, Jack saw himself and Douglas leaving the loss of his own mother when he was very young. Jack could relate to how Joy's little son was feeling. He embraced the little boy with a godlike compassion born from his own pain. That day, Jack embraced the sorrow in his own heart. I think of the Emmaus Walk, a walk that helps people to know and experience God more fully as we read about in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 53. Jack, Joy, Douglas, Warren, Christopher, Peter Whistler, and Harry find themselves on an Emmaus walk, listening and talking with one another as they experience the power of God's love transforming them along the way. I found myself on an Emmaus walk with these individuals in the movie and with my fellow presenters in preparation for this retreat. I felt God's love and grace transforming me along the way. I spent an enormous amount of time wandering in the wilderness, struggling with sorrow and suffering. Those times may come and go, but my journey through the wilderness is a time for me to deepen my roots in the Lord. It is a time for me to learn lessons in faith, hope, love, and trust. It is a time for me to learn to let go of my independence and become dependent upon God. It is a time for me to grow in a deeper relationship with the Lord. It is a time for me to lean on God and trust in Him, knowing that He makes all things work together for the good of those He loves. It is also a time to love Jesus better. I remember that moment with Father Brown and thank God for the grace to endure all that I have been going through. I am grateful the Lord became present to me through Father Brown who advised me to pray for the grace to persevere. So while I found myself with the disciples in the boat overcome with grief by the raging storms that took control of my life, I have truly come to know and understand 
how powerful my faith can be even against the mightiest of storms. I found out how powerful my faith can be in difficult times thanks to the power of God's love flowing from the grace I have found in him. In my parents' front yard stands a tree. The trunk of the tree shows exposure to bad weather. The tree looks like the divine tree surgeon pulled back the layers of bark and wood to get to the center where you can actually see the shape of a heart, the wounded heart of the tree. The tree speaks to me of human hearts wounded by pain from loss and separation. The tree also speaks to me of the divine tree surgeon healing the wounded hearts of those who grieve. What do I see in that tree? I see the wounded healer in me that is becoming a sanctuary to glorify God. In his book, God Help Me, Gregory Popcat writes, Scripture shows us no one who ever approached the Lord in faith left the experience unchanged. So let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace that we shall find grace when we are in need of help, hope, and healing. In Hebrews 4, verse 16.